That was a great dinner. So great. Wait, where'd you park the car? Oh, the one I just sold at Carvana. What? When did you do that? When you were still looking at the menu. I went on Carvana.com and all I had to do was enter the license plate or VIN, answer a few questions, and got a real offer in seconds. They picked up the car already? No, I parked around the corner. But they are picking it up tomorrow and paying me right on the spot. Oh, no wonder you picked up the check. Yeah, about that. Uh, thought we were going halfsies. Sell your car to Carvana. Visit Carvana.com or download the app to get a real offer in seconds. Saturday the 10th of June, I'm Jamie Eaton. and this was a week that saw Boris's WhatsApps cause a headache for Wishy, Dam Attack causes Ukraine devastation, Prince Harry has his day in court, and Holly returns to this morning. Grab a cup of something hot, put up your feet, and get up to speed on the seven biggest stories of the week. This is the standout seven from the Smart Seven. It's news, but not the news. There we all were on a Friday night enjoying a barbecue at Smart 7 Towers, congratulating ourselves on another week's hard work news gathering. Then, the political world drops a couple of almighty news bombs. Thanks, political world. First up with a weekend sharpener was Jack Smith, the federal prosecutor who announced a whopping 37 felony charges against Donald Trump related to retaining classified documents and obstructing justice. The documents show Trump told aides to hide boxes of paper from the FBI in a bathroom. 31 of those counts are under the Espionage Act, which carries a sentence of 10 years. Today, an indictment was unsealed, charging Donald J. Trump with felony violations of our national security laws, as well as participating in a conspiracy to obstruct justice. It's very important for me to note that the defendants in this case must be presumed innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt in a court of law. Trump responded immediately, calling Smith a deranged lunatic and psycho, which will, I'm sure, make things a lot better. Then early Friday evening saw the UK's mini-Trump resign as an MP. Ex-PM Boris Johnson decided he'd had enough gruelling constituency work, coincidentally just as the results of the Partygate investigation were becoming clear, saying that the letter from the committee was making it clear, much to my amazement, they're determined to use the proceedings against me to drive me out of Parliament. A defiant resignation designed to cause as much trouble as possible for the Tories. Is. That's according to Sky News' Beth Rigby. Well, I think what this does is it, it blows open, if you like, some of the tensions that have been simmering between different wings of the party. In the letter, there is no doubt that Boris Johnson is, is taking a, a, a swipe at, at the current Prime Minister. So that was Friday night, but a lot more happened during the week. Should we get on with it? Seven. This week saw the government stick to its plans to take its own COVID inquiry to court over Boris Johnson's WhatsApp messages. The XPM handed them over to the COVID inquiry after the public inquiry ordered the release of two years' worth of the messages. But the Cabinet Office had already announced it would be taking legal action against the request, claiming some of the material was irrelevant. It's thought some messages could raise questions about the current Prime Minister, including the controversial Eat Out to Help Out scheme. But while things could get embarrassing for Rishi, former Foreign Secretary Sir Malcolm Rifkin says the messages could be just as humiliating for Boris. He will, of course, be very concerned that any WhatsApps that are given to the inquiry may have information that might prove personally inconvenient. So you can see he has a personal interest in having some control over this. On Tuesday, Baroness Hallett, the chair of the COVID inquiry, says it's up to her to decide what's relevant. In my view, it is for the inquiry chair to decide what is relevant or potentially relevant. The Cabinet Office disagrees They invited me to withdraw the Section 21 notice. I declined. Rishi headed to his first official state visit to the US on Wednesday, leaving Deputy PM Oliver Downden in charge. But Rishi said he's not worried about being embarrassed by any messages and that those involved should participate transparently. It's important for me and others to cooperate with the inquiry in a spirit of candour and transparency. That's what I'm doing, and I'm spending a lot of my time on it because it is important that we learn the lessons of COVID. This week saw an environmental and social disaster unleashed in Ukraine as the Novokova Dam was blown up. A state of emergency was immediately declared in the region and thousands were evacuated. Ukrainian MP Alexei Goncharenko described the scenes. At least 150 tons of engine oil from the dam are now in the river. That's a huge ecological catastrophe. The consequences will be for decades. 
But Russia, they don't care. No one's claimed responsibility and both sides blame each other. But Ukraine's President Zelensky says he's no doubt what happened. It was an absolutely deliberate, prepared explosion. They knew exactly what they were doing. It was mined by the Russian occupiers and they blew it up. With mass evacuation underway and with fears water levels could rise further, Zelensky went on to accuse Russia of failing to help those trapped in parts of Kherson under Russian control. On Thursday, he travelled there to view the damage. The devastation caused isn't the only worry, though, as the loss of the dam has placed the Zaporizhia nuclear plant in danger as water from the reservoir was used to cool the reactors. Ukrainian defence adviser Yuri Sark says the impact's being closely monitored. The impact of this terrorist act has been devastating and the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant is being monitored very closely and Rafael Grossi will be arriving to inspect the facility and keep a close eye on the developments. Scott Lucas, analyst and professor at the Clinton Institute, says that if Russia is responsible, then it was likely an attempt to delay the highly anticipated Ukrainian counterattack. The immediate reaction was, well, that this is going to hold up the counteroffensive. And again, if the Russians did this, is what they were trying to do. And certainly in the area which has been flooded. You cannot move heavy armored equipment. Uh, The waters are too deep. It was a busy Thursday stateside as Rishi Sunak made his first visit to the White House since becoming Prime Minister. He was meeting with US President Joe Biden to discuss economic ties and Ukraine. And despite speculation a trade deal wasn't on the cards, the pair unveiled a new Atlantic Declaration, which aims to strengthen the defence and green energy sectors. Joe says the new partnership will be beneficial for everyone. Our economic partnership is an enormous strength that anchors everything that we do together. We want to harness that power to make sure we're creating good jobs and that growth is shared and no one gets left behind. And while it's not quite the post-Brexit free trade deal promised, Rishi says the new agreement's a sign of strong economic relations. Be in no doubt, the economic relationship between our two countries has never been stronger. The trade is worth hundreds of billions of pounds of dollars a year, and that trade is growing at something like 20% last year. And if that wasn't enough, ex-president and frontrunner for the Republican 2024 card Donald Trump was charged with violating the Espionage Act and obstructing justice. It's the first time an ex-president's been charged with federal crimes, and it's all about those pesky documents found in Mar-a-Lago. He's due in court next Tuesday, but just as night follows day, he released a statement protesting his innocence. I'm an innocent man. We will prove that again. Seven years of proving it, and here we go again. Very unfair. This week saw Prince Harry's much-anticipated testimony against the Daily Mirror in his case against them for phone hacking. He alleges the Mirror Group used unlawful methods to breach his privacy, citing 207 articles written over a 20-year period. Leaving the judge somewhat unimpressed, he missed the first day in court due to his daughter's second birthday, but did make time to appear on 60 Minutes with Anderson Cooper before the case kicked off to discuss his new stepmother and our new queen. How was she dangerous? Because of the need for her to rehabilitate her image. That made her dangerous because of the connections that she was forging within the British press. And there was open willingness on both sides to trade of information. And with a family built on hierarchy, and with her on the way to being Queen Consort, there was going to be people or bodies left in the street because of that. By Wednesday, Harry was done answering questions about a prank voicemail left by his brother William, a visit to a strip club and his breakup with Chelsea Davy. He described his experience in the witness stand as a lot. But speaking to GMB's Susanna Reid, former Deputy Features Editor at the News of the World, Paul McCullen, had little sympathy. Does that leave you with a sense of guilt or shame? Well, not really, because we did much worse to his dad. And uh, his dad was just dismissed it, oh, those annoying newspaper people, and you know, got over it. So, I mean, Prince Harry's big problem, he's got Prince in his name, so he's was born in an incredibly privileged position. Still to come on the standout seven, a devastating train crash in India, and this morning under the spotlight, right after this. Welcome back. There was tragic news in India this weekend after a passenger train derailed in the eastern state of Odisha on Friday, leaving nearly 300 people dead and more than 800 injured. It's thought a signalling error led to the train being sent onto the wrong track, where it collided with a freight train loaded with iron ore. It's the country's deadliest train track in 20 years, and Odisha's chief minister, Naveen Patnaik, says he's devastated by what's happened. I'm deeply distressed by this extremely tragic train accident. 
I have to thank the local people who have worked overnight to save people from the wreckage. It was a hebdomadist, horriblest for ITV as Holly Willoughby returned to this morning after Schofield Gate. As 10am Monday rolled around, she delivered a tense opening message and another apology just for you. You, me and all of us at this morning gave our love and support to someone who was not telling the truth, who acted in a way that they themselves felt that they had to resign from ITV and step down from a career that they loved. That is a lot to process. But by Tuesday, the focus had switched from the hosts to the bosses. They were hauled before the Culture Committee to answer questions about the scandal. And after Holly's cuddly opener, SNP MP John Nicholson couldn't resist a quick dig. I suppose I should ask, first of all, are you okay? He went on to condemn this morning editor Martin Frizzell's outrageously dismissive and flippant comments over whether there's a toxic work environment on the show where he said... It was toxic. I've always found toxic. Is aubergine. Do you like aubergine? ITV director of policy Magnus Brook was forced to defend the company, saying they take their responsibilities of safeguarding very seriously. We do take uh, all of these allegations very seriously, precisely because we do have a culture uh, 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 in which people's conduct it matters enormously. It's been a record-breaking opening weekend for Spider-Verse 2. The animated sequels raked in more than $120 million in box office sales and had the most successful opening day of any movie this year. And that might just be down to the powers of its star, Shamik Moore, who's been open about how he manifested himself into voicing the role of Miles Morales. He's been speaking to Sky News following the film's release and says he's confident his technique could see him become Spider-Man in live-action form too. It's meant to be, will be, but I'm, 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 I'm very optimistic. I said I am Miles Morales, I am Spider-Man, and I think that applies to live action as well. So (laughs) I guess we'll see. You've been listening to The Smart 7. We'll be back tomorrow at 7 a.m. Hit that follow button and have a great day. Give us seven minutes, we'll give you the world.